I would ask you as you hear a song or, or read a word or, or in your scripture you read about the precious blood of Jesus, what does that do to you? I have a confession to make. As I was sitting here, hearing those words, I was holding back tears. And then I asked myself, why am I holding back tears? Right? Have you ever, have you ever wondered that? Why do we men specifically hold back tears? Tears of joy? Tears of pain? Tears of grief? I mean, if, if that, the precious blood of Christ, doesn't do something to us, then there's pride in our life. Why would I hold back the tears? Pride. Pride. I'm not going to mess up my makeup, <laughs> ladies. It's for pride. Let's not be proud. Let's be broken. Let's be humble. Let's realize that if it were not for that precious blood of Christ, we would all be yet in our sin. Whew, that was a good song. Thank you very much, you guys. Precious blood of Christ. Would you turn with me, please, to Acts chapter 1? Since you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 1. We're going to be in 15 through 26. Chapter 1 of Acts, verses 15 through 26. <clears throat> and the title of this message is Chosen. Now, it is not about the, the TV series or Netflix, or whoever makes it. It's not about that. I've got my own thoughts about that if you want to hear them. Sidebar later. <laughs> it's not about that at all. It's about the chosen, these chosen, us as chosen. So if we would, let's read the scripture so that it's familiar in our minds and then we'll, we'll discuss it. Acts chapter 1, verses 15 through 26. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of the names was about 120. And said, men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit before the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered with us and obtained a part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of his iniquity and fell headlong and burst open in the midst of, in the middle of it, in the middle, and all of his entrails gushed, gushed out. And it became known to all those who dwell in Jerusalem, so that this field is called in our own lane, in our own language, Akel Damah. That is the field of blood. Verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it. And let another take his office. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness for us of his resurrection. And they purposed two, Joseph, called Barnabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, O Lord, who knows the hearts of all, Show which of these two you have chosen to take part in the ministry and apostleship of which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lot, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Would you, uh, let's go to the word, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get into the word. Father, as we open up this book of Acts, uh, this, this book that you have given us uh, to convict us, to guide us, to lead us, to help us to know what we must as the chosen be about and doing. Father, I pray that you would allow your Holy Spirit this morning to speak to us. Father, that we would be of, of no distraction about the world around us or the people around us or even our own thoughts of what this might mean. Lord, that your Holy Spirit would speak clearly through your word to tell us exactly what you mean through this. Father, how must this change our life? Teach us. Father, give us the boldness and the wisdom to apply these thoughts to our everyday life. Lord, give us the privilege of serving you and being chosen. Give us a reliance upon your word, upon this perfect, holy word that you have kept pure for us throughout eternity. Lord, we love you and we praise you for this. And in your son's name we pray. Amen. If you remember the last verse that we read this, this last Lord's Day, last Sunday, if you remember it, I'm going to read it again for you. It's one verse up in verse 14 of chapter 1. It says this, All these continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary and the mother of Jesus 
and with his brothers. So see, they were all alone. Do you remember the story from last week? Jesus had, been, had, had gone on. He was ascended. The Holy Spirit had not yet come. There's going to be a 10-day gap where they are alone. They're together, 120 as we just read, and we're going to read again. 120 are together, but they're alone with what really matters. With Jesus. Jesus, the captain of their faith, is no longer on this earth. The Holy Spirit has not been sent yet to live inside them. He's not there. They're alone. They're vulnerable. They're in danger. They're weak. And so what do they do? What do we find them doing? Praying. Continuing in prayer. If you notice, and I hope that you do, in our church service, in this worship service every Sunday morning, there's no fewer than about six or eight times that we pause for prayer. It's not by accident. And it's not a gap between two different things, so it'll blend gently together. It's because we need it. We must be about prayer. We are weak. We are frail. We are humble beings, and we need the Lord's help in this. And so we pray. Here we find them. They continued prayer. They were waiting in Jerusalem in this upper room. And now we catch up with them, waiting in prayer. And they're waiting for none other than the gift. It was called a gift of the Holy Spirit to be given. This promise that would come from the Father, and the Father always keeps his, command, his, his commitments to us. Always he's promised to give us something. And now the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us. Read with me, if you would, turn to John 14, 15 and 18. This is a wonderful set of verses that I just couldn't leave out. John 14, 15 through 18 says this. If you love me, hear what it's saying to us. If you love me, sorry, we'll pause. I love hearing those those pages flip. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna get done reading by the time you get there. So let's wait. John chapter 14. We should stay in this Bible, man. Bring it with you. Open it. John 14, 15 through 18 says this: If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray to the Father, and He will give you another Helper, that you may abide, that He may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, but I will come to you. This is a a great reminder, a great promise from the one who keeps His promises. Jesus is saying, if you love me, keep my commandments, and you're going to have help. I'm not going to leave you alone to do this. It's not just by yourself that you've got to kind of pull these bootstraps up and kind of be a good Christian. You have a helper. As a matter of fact, if you struggle in this walk, you might question the fact of, do I have a helper? It might cause you to think back, though, maybe I'm just, maybe these are just thoughts in my head. I'm, I'm challenging you, maybe, this morning. Listen, maybe it's just thoughts in my head, this knowledge, this information that I've been given, that I've, that I've been in church all my life, and I've been through VBS. I know when to raise my hand, but I've never accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. If it's just information, you might not have the Holy Spirit. So you might struggle more than others. I wonder, how do some people live this life the way that they do? How do they live it in joy through cancer and death and disease? How do they, how do they suffer with such, with such beauty? I could never do that. It may be a clue that you need to research and check your own salvation. It's not a, not a sin to say that. It's actually good for us to remember this. The Holy Spirit living in us, it's a promise given to us. It's a promise that he will fill us, indwell us, and speak through us. The Holy Spirit is soon coming. This day of Pentecost is just around the corner for these men. They don't have to wait very long. They don't know it yet, but they don't have to wait very long. And we see Peter taking his rightful place as we we get to verse 16 here. We see Peter, the one that was promised, the one that was said, you're going to be the rock. He was that, that disciple, if you've ever heard it, he's got the the shoe-shaped mouth, the foot-shaped mouth. He's constantly sticking his foot in his mouth before the Holy Spirit. After this, great things happen with Peter. We're getting ready to find out some of those things. He stands up and he takes his rightful place in the middle of the disciples, these women and this large group of men, people of 120 at least, and he says, verse 16, men and brethren, get get your attention. Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before the mouth of David, concerning Judas. This was on their mind, by the way. It just happened 40 days, maybe 42 days plus, that Judas, with a kiss, traitored his own Savior. They didn't forget him. 
This was very common in their mind, very, very fresh in their emotions. This group of about 120 people aren't just friends and neighbors. These aren't just people that gathered up and said, hey, we got, got some more food upstairs if you want to come. We're going to have some good music. You know, we got a great youth group. We've got a cool, edgy band. The pastor wears skinny jeans. It's not what they were saying. These were people that they trusted, that they know, that they had already gone through so much with and were going to go through even more with, yet yeah, to the point of death. These are brothers and sisters who had experienced and seen the risen Christ. Not just people they picked up along the side of the street. These are those who were closer than family. This is the beginning of the New Testament church. We are in the New Testament church. That's us right here today. This is the very beginnings of it. It starts out with 12 men. It goes to 120. Then there's 500 who are eyewitnesses to Christ. And now millions who have been eyewitnesses of their heart being changed to Christ. Well, we'll soon see what happens when the Holy Spirit comes in power into these people's lives. I don't want us to lose sight of this, this blessing of this third part of the Trinity, who we so often neglect. We've talked about this quite a bit in the last few months. How God we know, Jesus, yeah, we believe in. The Holy Spirit, eh, don't know who that guy is. We need to know that it is a gift, it's power that's coming, and they are waiting for him. And so we see, as Peter tells the, tells the people that the Holy Spirit is coming, and he tells them, as a matter of fact, that he's already spoken to David. Are you aware that the Holy Spirit spoke in the Old Testament? This isn't just something that came along in the New Testament, like God says, you know what? We need a third part. Didn't have this figured out at the beginning, but now I think we need a third part. The New Testament, well, let's, let's send them down some help. No, this was the plan from the very beginning. The Trinity has been there since before the creation of time. Eternity's eternity. He's been there. In the Old Testament, he was working, even through David, as, as Peter just said. Prophecy that was given a thousand years before. Did you realize that? This prophecy was given a thousand years before Judas was ever born. Before Jesus was ever denied. In Psalm 69, we picked that up. That verse 20 is written directly from, it's Peter quoting Psalms 69. He says, for it is written in the book of Psalms. He gives the reference. This is where I found it, boys. Let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it and let another take his office. See, Peter's leading to something. He's saying there's, there's a job we have to do. We have to fill this position. And we're going to fill it in a very interesting way. We're going to get to that in just a moment. He's talking about this direct prophecy of how Christ's enemies are going to be coming after him. How he will have enemies. Matter of fact, Jesus says, if they hate you, know that they hated me first. They hated me first and they killed Jesus, as a matter of fact. The enemies of him are going to try to destroy him and they will be destroyed as Judas was. These unbelieving Jews and Judas, this traitor who betrayed him with a kiss nonetheless for silver that he bought this land with. And now... We need to slow down at this moment. We need to, we need to slow down. We need to, we need to look closely at this Holy Spirit and who He is. Not to run past, because there's a lot in the book of Acts that we won't get to, but we must see this. Many wrongly think that, uh, that this Holy Spirit was a New Testament phenomenon, but He wasn't. He's been around forever. The Old Testament speaks of Him often, as a matter of fact. We see Him very clearly present in the lives of the men. Let me give you a couple of examples. We see Him living outside of the lives. We in the Old Testament, when you see it, and the reason why people confuse it and often think he's not there is because he doesn't indwell the people. He comes and he goes. He's there for a time and then he, then he leaves. But he's there. He's very present, very much so working. The Old Testament, he comes upon people for a select and a temporary time. In the New Testament, he's going to come and indwell the people as he has us to live with them forever. So the Old Testament, some examples of this where he dwells with them and not in them is uh, Judges. Many of the judges, the prophets, and the kings. We just read, Doc just read the verse from uh, 2 Peter about the prophecy. We're going to read it again in just a moment. Being given to holy men, it's the Holy Spirit speaking through them. We have men like Joshua in Numbers chapter 27. The Holy Spirit speaks directly and works through him. David, many times, the Psalms and in 1 Samuel. Even Saul, do you remember? He prophesied. And then later, the Holy Spirit was taken from him. And he went almost crazy. Throwing a javelin towards David, had many struggles. The Holy Spirit was in all those people. Joseph, Samson, 
the 70 elders of the book of Numbers, we see the Holy Spirit working throughout the Old Testament, so know that He's always been here. So who is it that Peter spoke, speaks? Who is it that Peter says spoke through David again in that verse? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks through David at this time. It's clearly seen in both the Old and the New. He has always been at work in our lives, speaking His words of wisdom and leading us. He's still doing this. It is the grace of God and the mercy of God that we have Him. Could you imagine living the life without it? All you have is 66 books. Jesus has gone on to heaven. Live the rest of your life and get to heaven. Good luck. Now see, we don't understand it because we've never experienced it. I mean, maybe those that don't know Christ and are trying to live a good moral life just for goodness sake, maybe they know what I'm talking about. But those that have the Holy Spirit know that He gives us a power. He indwells us. He gives us conviction of sin. Can you say amen to that? I hope you experience the conviction of sin. When you sin, the Holy Spirit should be punching you right in the face, men. Gently, maybe, doing this to women. You girls are softer than us. Men need a punch in the face sometimes. The Holy Spirit does that. That's what He does for us. That's part of His job and, and gift and, and grace that mercy gives us from Him. That God gives us from Him. So here in the New Testament, even today, he speaks. It's called divine inspiration. The Holy Spirit speaks and He gave men words to write and it was taken up into 66 books. It's called the Bible. The Holy Scripture, the Word of God. As a matter of fact, the ESV says it was God breathed. Likens it back to creation. Do you remember when God breathed on Adam? What happened? Life came into him. The Holy Spirit breathes out the good Word, the news, it's taken into Scripture and it brings life to us who love the Lord and call Him Savior. First Peter, let me read you these verses. It's, it's back to what, what uh, Mr. Oliver read for us a moment ago. It says this, Second Peter is 1, 19 and 21. Through the very end it says, And so we have prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as light shines into the dark places until the, di- until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Knowing this, First, knowing this, first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. How did we get the Bible? How did we get Old Testament prophecy? When holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit, not for private interpretation. You don't get to choose what it says. God already did that. He gives it to us by the Holy Spirit. Second Timothy is another one. Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Very important verses for this about the inspiration of God. It says this, Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now there's some words in there we don't, tend to appreciate very much. Correction? Reproof? I don't like those. I like to think I'm doing pretty good, right? The Scripture is there to correct us, to reprove us, sometimes to punch us in the face. Men, that's the Holy Spirit speaking through the Word that He has given to holy men as they wrote it down. It is God-breathed. The Bible has very many things. Let me sum this up really quickly. The Bible's central character, do you know who it is? God. Do you know who we live like it is? Man. We act like the Bible's central character is how to save man, the glory of man, the deification of man. It's not. It's God. God is the central character, not man. It is God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The central theme of the Bible is the revelation of God to man, not the other way around. It's not man finding God. We don't do that. As a matter of fact, none of you would search for God if it were not for the Holy Spirit calling you. You're dead. Dead men don't look for anything. They have to be brought alive. It's the Holy Spirit speaking to us. The central theme is the revelation of God to man. The central purpose of the Bible is to showcase God's holiness. We speak of this often. He is holy, holy, holy. It's three times. God's holiness is the central purpose to showcase this. And it also does one other thing. The holier we see God, the more sinful we see ourselves. And that is a great thing. 
The holiness of God is showcased, and the sinfulness of man is seen in this. The summation of all the Bible, this wonderful word that God's given us, would you say, many people I ask when they think, when I ask them what the Bible is, they say it's a book of rules. It's rules. That's why you Christians are so boring. You have all those rules you have to follow. They say it's rules, or they say it's morals. Well, it's so that we live moral lives, right? It's, it's for the flourishment of, of mankind. Don't kill, don't steal, don't adultery, whatever those other seven are. I don't know. They say it's for morals. Do you believe that? It is. Is that the primary reason? No, that's secondary. Perhaps they say it's just for training in life, like how to get your kids to not go to prison, just to make them good people. So they say it's rules, it's training, it's a moral guidelines. That's not what the Scripture is actually there for. That is a function of it, but it's not its main purpose. Its main purpose, the, the main reason God gets the Bible into our heads, our hands, and our hearts is so that we know Him. So that we know Him and that we glorify Him. It's so that we can stand in His presence and say, holy, holy, holy. It's not for our deification. It's not so that we would better know Him. If it was just about salvation, by the way, sometimes we think that the Bible is just so that we can know how to be saved. You know, you'd only need one book for that. The book of John. Just throw out the other 65 and just take the book of John. You have the whole plan of salvation. Who is Jesus? What do you need? What have you done? Here's his blood. We have another 65 books that tells us it's much more than just, it's just rules. It's much more than just morals. It is the word of God literally breathed down to us. It's God himself stepping down to the earth to show us who he is. The journalist questions, if you ever had to write a research paper and you have to ask some certain questions, who, what, when, where, why, and how, these are all answered in the Scripture. It's not who, what, when, why, and how is man. It's who, how, when, where, why, God. All those things are answered in the Scripture for us that He gave us through the Holy Spirit. The who is always focused on Christ. The how is always focused on Christ. The answer is always God willed it. He did it. The scripture is a wonderful gift. It is a perfect gift. The central character is always God. It's how we know him. And that is the greatest gift of all. I've heard heard people say before that if you want to know God, read the Bible. Another good quote that goes along with it. If you want to hear God speak, read it out loud. You ever thought about that? Let me say it again because I don't think you were listening. If you want to know God, read the Bible. If you want to hear God speak, read it out loud. (laughs) Sometimes reading the Bible out loud actually says a lot more to us. Oftentimes I have to read it out loud to understand what it's even saying. Get lost in my own thoughts if I just read it to myself. Knowing the Scripture is, is knowing God. Reading the Scripture, studying it, meditating it, will do one of two things to you. Maybe you've experienced this. I've, I've watched this happen in people's lives as I'm discipling them or evangelizing with them or whatever it is. I've seen it happen. Knowing God greater does one of two things. You either love him more deeply or you will hate him more vehemently. Knowing God through the scripture will cause one of two things. Cause you to run to the cross or flee from the cross. Which is it doing in your life? Which does this Bible, this perfect word of God do? Do you love him more the more you know of him? Or do you hate him more the more you read of him? One of the two will be happening. Many of, uh, many of people in our city and in our church even would say, yes, of course, I love God. I love Christ. I love Jesus. I love the church. The words can often be cheap. My question to you is, do you keep his commandments? There's the sign. You say, scripture and verse, preacher, prove it. Where is that found? That's found in 1 John 5.3. It says this, 1 John 5.3 says, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. That little last part on there is not just tagged on there to, to give you a little more to memorize. For the love of God is that we keep His commandments. If you love God, you will keep His commandments, and they are not burdensome. If you find, let me... Let me just pique your curiosity for a minute. If you find that they're burdensome, it might be that you don't love God. 
if you see their commandments, the rules, the, the morals, the, the right living that he requires, if you find that burdensome, you probably don't love God. If it's a struggle for you, I get that. I live that. I, I know the temptation and the sin that pulls at my, my flesh. But if it's burdensome, if I, if I hate to live according to God's rules, it's because I hate God. The more you love him, the more you will desire to please him and to know him and to be in fellowship with him. Question, do you trust God's word? Do you trust the Bible? And I don't mean do you trust it like, uh, like yeah, I've, I've got it and, and I'll read it and I'll pick it up. But do you believe that it is divinely inspired, that the Holy Spirit spoke it, and that it is perfectly pinned as it is from beginning to end? Because this is the battlefront today. There's two, there's two fronts that Satan is working over today that he's always been insidiously attacking. Number, number one's the family. He will always do that. Go back to the Garden of, of, of Eden, Adam and Eve, very first thing, tempted Eve. He's always been fighting against the family. The second is the inerrancy of word. Every church, every denomination, every life, every person, their first failures whenever they look at the Scripture and they say, did God really mean that? Which is the question Satan asked Eve. Is that really true? Can I not just fudge this a little bit or cut and paste and add, you know, some blurry lines over these parts I don't like? Do you trust the Word of God? I'm asking you. Do you find it inerrant? Perfect, cover to cover. I remember hearing a, a pastor, Leonard Ravenhill, he said this. When I read the book, when I read the story about Jonah, I believe the Bible so much that if the book of Jonah would have said that Jonah opened up his mouth and swallowed that whale, I would have believed it instead of the other way around. Do you believe the Bible just as it's written? I just believe what I read. Is it inerrant? Is it authoritative? There's another question. Authoritative means does it have authority over your life? I read it, I follow what it says. I keep the commandments. Thirdly, is it sufficient? Is it inerrant, authoritative, and sufficient? Is it enough? Or are you constantly looking for other things to add to it? I just add a little bit of secular humanism, just add a little bit of Dr. Phil, Oprah. Just add something to it to give it some teeth or to give it something that makes me feel better. Is it sufficient? Could you be given the Bible and nothing else and be happy with that? Or do you need more? Do you look for more healings or wealth or prosperity? Is the Scripture enough? I would tell you, if I did not believe the Scripture, inerrant, totally authoritative, and fully sufficient, I wouldn't be here today. I would be hanging from a rock somewhere, playing out in the woods on a Sunday, on a beautiful day today. I certainly wouldn't be giving this church this religion, this thing, my, my life, my forever. Why would I waste my time if I can't trust this Bible? I wouldn't. I promise you, I would be doing something else. Is it sufficient? Is it authoritative? Is it inerrant in your life? Because if you can't answer that question, you will find yourself someday veering off and going to find your own thing. Searching after your own loves and your own desires to please you, to find joy within you. Is the Scripture enough for you? So to answer that question, it's, it's experiential. How does it play out in your life? Not what do you think in your head, but how does it affect your life? When your neighbors watch you across the street, when they see what you buy at the hot spot or at the grocery store, or they hear the words that come out of your mouth whenever you something bad happens, what do they see? What, what, what experientially do they know of you and your love for Christ? That's where it really takes effect. Do you trust this Bible? Do you live according to it? Does it change your life? Because the living and the following of the Scripture will prove who you are. It's the proof. Experientially, it is the proof. So let's jump back to our verses here. Verse 20. And see what, Peter's, what Peter says he must do, to the, what these men must do. Verse 20 says this. Let another take his office. It leaves right there. Judas been a traitor. He had denied and, and sent Christ to the cross. He had his part in that. He died headlong in the field, hung himself. And now it says that, that another must take his place according to, the, according to the prophecy that we read in Psalms. Verse 21 then goes on to say, Therefore, of these men of whom have accompanied us since the, beginning, since the, the, the time the Lord Jesus went out among us, 
beginning with the baptism of John, so it goes all the way back to the baptism of John, to the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with, with us in the resurrection. And they, pros, and they purposed two men. So they picked two guys, Joseph called Barnabas and then Matthias. And they prayed. What did they do? They prayed. Start that. Don't, don't, don't forget that part. And they prayed and said, O oh Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show which of these two men you have chosen to take part in the ministry and apostleship of which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his place. And then they cast their lot, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Peter says, the Lord chose twelve, we only have eleven, we need to fill this place. According to what the Lord has set up, let's fill this place, and we need to find a man. And so verse 24 says very clearly where they started. A lot of times we skip straight to the lots part because we don't understand it. They did what? They cast lots? Isn't that like gambling? What is it they did there? No, they started here. Did you see the prayer? And they prayed. They said, oh, Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show us which of these two you have chosen. And then they cast their lot. See, it, in, it, it set on the, the process that they trust God to show them. It's not just a, a mere chance. It's not like flipping the coin. Oh, I didn't like heads. Let's try it again. Nope, heads again. Keep flipping it until they get the answer they want. They're saying, I rely on you, God. I I trust in you. All of the commentaries and the theologians, by the way, said this is an actual casting of lots. What that looks like, we're not positive. If it was writing the name on a a rock or on a piece of clay tablet, putting it in a hat, and then they, they shake it, and then the name and the apostleship comes up, there's some confusion there. The point is, it was done with a casting of lots, and it was done trusting God fully, in his sovereignty as to who would be chosen. They prayed first. Secondly, let me, let me give us some more, uh, us Baptists, let me give us some more reliance. This is never seen again after this moment. Never again in the New Testament will you hear of this. Never again did the, did the disciples, the apostles, or any of the early church cast lots. This is the last time. Interesting, right? I think, I believe, my own theory is because what happens in about a day or two or three days The Holy Spirit comes to live in them. The Holy Spirit takes up and indwells them and gives them direction and guidance and leadership that they didn't have during this moment. They didn't have Jesus there to pick the the 12th man. So they pray to God and they use the means that they have and then they never use it again. And so this casting of lots, they were responding to what God would tell them and show them. And he says, pick from these two men. What do we know about those two men? They were qualified. Either one of them were qualified. They didn't put 500 names in a hat and say, let's just see what happens. They picked from two qualified men that were responsible and had been with Christ during this time. And then in verse 21, Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us from all of this time, that the Lord Jesus, when he went in and when he went out, had been with us since the beginning, since the baptism of John, to this day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness. See, the job they were fulfilling, they were filling, was not paper boy. It was an altar boy. It was a witness of the resurrection of Christ. There is a, a very serious job to be done. And they wanted to fill this position with a man. Matthias was chosen. Matthias means glory to God. Or, let me make sure that is proper. It means gift of God. Matthias was chosen for God, of God to be this 12th man, and then we don't really hear much else about him in the New Testament. Why? I, I don't know. I would love to find out someday in heaven I will. But he was chosen through this process. My question for us today as we close, are you faithful? Would you have been chosen? Would the 500 there that day, the 120, the 12, the 11, the 1, would they have looked at you and said, That's a faithful follower of Christ. That one knows the Lord and Christ as their Savior. I've watched it in their life. Would they pick you as one that could possibly be an apostle, a deacon, a preacher, a teacher, a Sunday school teacher, a prayer? Or would they be surprised? Oh, you go to church? Wait, you're a Christian? Really? 
Would they find you faithful? Are you keeping the Lord's commandments? Are you a faithful witness? Are you fully trusting in God's word? Is it authoritative? Is it inerrant and is it sufficient? This morning, I ask you that as we close, to think on those things in your own life, to do business, to actually and honestly talk to God and say, Lord, how do I view your word? Because if it's authoritative, you'll, we'll, you'll be in it. You'll spend time in his word. And then you'll apply it to your life. Lord, is it authoritative? If it's not, repent. That's for the Christians. Maybe there's some here this morning that have never really known the Holy Spirit to move and convict and work in their life. And they're not sure of their salvation. You could not walk out of here today and, and, and be assured of the fact that if you died... You would stand before God and Jesus would say, he's with me. I've covered his sin. You couldn't be sure of that. The answers are found in Scripture. I would love to spend today walking through those Scriptures with you. If you're not sure, don't leave here without finding the Christ that loves you that much. That came and died on the cross for you. This morning, as we have this invitation, we're going to have you to stand in just a few moments. and We're going to sing a few songs. It's a moment. A time, not long, for you to come up and to pray, to speak to God, to speak with others, to do whatever it is God's convicting you of right at this moment. Will you be obedient? I pray that you will. Would you pray with me, please? Father, as we come to this moment in your service, on your day, in your house with your people, as we've opened your word, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will have his way in us. And that everything that is done or needs to be done will be done for your glory. Father, you are the central theme of your own story. Father, this word is about you. It is for you. It is to you. Lord, we were created to glorify you. I pray that this morning, every heart and soul in here has been softened to that point. I pray that pride is is not ruling our lives, but that humility has been sensed and seen. Father, have your will in our lives today. Break hearts where they must be broken. Take out the stone and put in the heart of flesh. Father, it is for your glory we ask these things. And we wait expectantly on your son. In his name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me, please?